Okay, we're going to get started. We're going to be back in Revelation chapter 2. I will, uh, if, if anyone had any questions regarding the sermon, you can go ahead and post them in the chat now, and I will get to them. There was something I wanted to show everybody regarding uh, our epistle text, which I, you know, this is one of those times where sometimes the Greek, uh, knowing the Greek and the languages is super helpful um, in, in, in at least giving you a chance of uh, getting at the gist of it. Because always when you translate, there are limitations uh, in every translation. It's because it, it, uh, biblical languages, just like any other languages, they're not codes. They, they don't have one-to-one correlation. There are words and, and grammatical constructions that um, having an equivalent in, the, in, in modern English is sometimes tough to kind of sort out. So, you know, as somebody who translates the biblical languages, I recognize the limitations. And this is why it's always good for your pastors to know their biblical languages and to actually read the text ahead of time. I'm just saying, uh, <clears throat> one, of my, one of my, uh, I guess it's one of my pet peeves or uh, things that I like to uh, point out from time to time. So with that, we are going to pray and then we will get started. Hang on one second here. There we go. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, so that by patience and comfort of your holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so before we get started, and let me do this real quick here. See if I can find this. It's over here. Go to my chat window. Very good. Uh, Stephen Elliott, a uh, question from today's gospel text. Why did Jesus call Peter Satan? <laughs> In this particular case, because uh, uh, he, he becomes the mouthpiece for, for the devil. Um, so, yeah, he was likening Peter to Satan because uh, he had his mind on earthly things. Uh, so in this case, uh, Peter's uh, basically, uh, see, what he said is a temptation to keep Peter uh, from Jesus from what it is that he was sent to do. He wasn't sent to uh, go and establish his kingdom here on earth. He was sent for the purpose of laying down his life and becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Oh, it's muted. Hang on a second here. Let's see here. Uh, unmute. There we go. Can you all hear me now? There we go. Thanks for uh, pointing that out. So the answer to the question, yay, all right, yeah, I, oh, my apologies here. I'm, I'm, I have seen your moments more often. So the question is, why did Peter, uh, Jesus call Peter Satan? The reason is simple, uh, because uh, Peter was being a mouthpiece for the devil uh, to try to get Jesus off mission. To, uh, you know, Jesus did not come uh, for the purpose of uh, setting up a glorious kingdom. He came for the purpose of laying down his life and to bleed and to die and to be obedient to the point of death on a cross in order to secure our redemption, to secure our salvation, to be our substitute. That was the idea here. So uh, Peter, basically trying to dissuade Christ from the actual reason why he came, uh, becomes the mouthpiece of Satan, and it's uh, rightly seen then as a temptation. Okay, so what we're going to do here, before we get too far, I wanted to show you all this. I'm going to duplicate this tab. We will be in Revelation chapter 2 unless we have a, a rip-roaring uh, conversation is the best way I can put it. And let me make sure I'm going to share my screen on my Apple TV here in the church. Uh, in Romans chapter, hello, Romans chapter 10, or was it, no, 12, my apologies, 12, 12, 9. In the sermon, you may have heard this, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring this out. This is a, a, one of those reasons why knowing your biblical languages is super de duper helpful. And I wanted to show it to you, at least from the Greek, so you can kind of see how this works. And I know it's all Greek to you, but that's all right. I'll, I'll be here to, uh, to walk you through it. So the ESV translates this Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. These sound like commands. But the way the grammar works in the Greek, it's descriptive, not prescriptive. It's kind of a fascinating thing. And so in verse 9, I'll read this out. It says, He agape, anupakritas, anupakritas. So here it is, he agape, the love. Okay, he is is the uh, the definite article, the. Agape is love. You've heard that word before. And uh, anukritas means genuine or sincere. That's kind of the gist of what it says. And you know, this isn't even a full sentence. The love sincere, the love genuine. No verb. 
And it's not a command. It's kind of, it's almost like, I, as I read this in the Greek, it looks like a heading, okay? And then this is where it gets interesting, is that the verbs are participles, all right? Now, I know that, like me, when you graduated from 11th grade, you did everything you could to forget everything that you were taught regarding English grammar, because grammar is just dry and gravelly. And the thing I hated worse about grammar class was then those, those lessons that had to do with poetry. Me and poetry don't get along very well. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm about as poetic as a Mack truck. Anyway, but the, the point is, is this, is that if you were to think back to your basic grammar, um, when a verb, uh, when, when you have something ending in ing, okay, that's your participle form. Okay, and so here's what's happening here is that you were not seeing a command to abhor what is evil. This is a description of the love that is genuine or the love that is, uh, that is um, sincere. So here we ha- have our first word, and it's, it's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, apostu guntes is uh, how it's pronounced in the Greek. And it's a participle, present active participle, abhor. But it doesn't, when it's parsed out, it's abhorring. Abhorring ta paneron. Abhorring the evil. The love that is genuine is abhorring the evil. And then we get uh, this middle uh, passive, uh, you know, verb, glued. You know, I won't go ahead and pronounce everything out, but the, the, the verb here, uh, kalao, means to be glued or fastened. And it's passive. It's not active, and, and that's, the, that's the funny thing. So if, um, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I think of like cruel tricks that uh, kids do to each other, you know, uh, you know, stunts and things like that. You know, so you take a kid and you, uh, and you decide that it'd be fun to Velcro him to the, uh, the gym wall or something like that. So the kid's stuck to the wall and he can't get down. Everybody laughs because the poor kid had nothing to do with it that was done to him. But the way the passive verb here is working is, is that it's describing that we have been passively glued to the good. It's not saying hold fast to what is good because the verb is passive. You have been glued to the good. The love that is genuine. You are abhorring what is evil. You are glued to the good. Uh, Te Philadelphia. Philadelphia, we all know what that means. Brotherly love. The brotherly love unto one another is, is, is well kind of hard to pull this one into the English, is, is devoted. You are devoted to it, to the brotherly love of one another. Uh, and so you, you see what's going on here. In this portion of Scripture, and this is why I made a big to-do about it, and it, over and over again, you know, when you see in Scripture and you consider what it says regarding our sanctification, uh, it becomes harder and harder for you to think that somehow your salvation is has anything to do with your sanctification. Your sanctification is a result of your justification. Your justification is in no way the result of your sanctification. And so you'll note then the, the, what the, this text is actually descriptive. It's describing who we are in Christ. It's describing the love that is genuine. And this is what we all are, what we long for and things of this nature. And so, you know, we must always be on the guard against the, the tricks of the devil to somehow sneak our good works in as part of the formula for our justification. They are absolutely, I'm going to make, make this clear, good works are necessary, but they're necessary by virtue of species. So, the, you know, like, I mean, what good would a cat do if a cat didn't meow? I mean, what kind of, you know, you know, or if you had a cow that didn't moo, you know? That doesn't make any sense. They're dogs that don't bark. I mean, you know, might, might as well be cats then, you know. So, you know but the, so the idea here is, is that you, you do what you do because you are what you are. And you can see this over and over again when you carefully work through and run the verbs in the text in relation to sanctification. So you, you get the idea. All right. In Ephesians, here's the question from Oscar. In Ephesians, when Paul said we must work out our salvation... What did he mean? Actually, it's not in Ephesians, it's in Philippians. And let me show it to you, uh, because over and again, that is one of the classic texts that is thrown into our faces, you know, from those who, are, who deny salvation by grace through faith apart from works. 
And I will note this, when you see it in context, you're going to go, oh, because <laughs> the context is so easy on this one. Um, let, no, let me make sure I've, I've got to hunt this down now. Uh, I don't think it's in Philippians 1. I do believe it's um, in Philippians 2. Hang on a second. <laughs> and if you find it, go ahead, before me, go ahead and throw it into the text, uh, into the chat all. There's only one Philippians. Um, hang on a second here. Yeah, yeah. You know, I meant to. Oh, how did I miss it? Hang on a second. Work out. Let's do this. And I need it in the epistles. In a memento. Philippians 2.12. There it is. Okay. I was in the right place. It's just that while scanning, these old eyes are somehow getting distracted. All right. All right. So Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but also much more in my absence. And here's the phrase taken out of context. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, there you go. You gotta, better get busy. But notice there's a comma there. Okay, <laughs> this is an incomplete sentence. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his own good pleasure. It is God who works in you. So you'll note here, he's not saying go and save yourself, but working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, basically it means to walk it out, and it is God who's, who's working and willing in you and, and doing the heavy lifting. Now, we participate in our sanctification. This is absolutely true. Uh, Luther had a funny way of uh, describing it, though, when it comes to our sanctification. Uh, he, he, he basically says that we are a flea on the back of a horse, you know, and, uh, and God is allowing us to touch the reins, but Christ is the one who has control of the reins, and we're, we're, we're sitting next to him, but uh, we, we have the least bit in our sanctification. The idea here is, is that being sanctified properly as a Christian is to believe who you are in Christ, to believe the baptismal promises, to believe that that you have a new person that you've been given in your in your, in your salvation, and then walking that out by faith. You'll note that what you believe is going to end up impacting what you do with your daily life. So if you believe that God is going to judge the living and the dead, and that you know that stealing is a sin, you're not going to be actively going to Walmart and engaging in the five finger discount. That you, that's just out of the question because you believe that that is a sin and, you, and that plays out then in your actions, right? But if you don't believe that there is a God or that somehow some, you know, something's only a sin if you get caught, then you're going you're gonna to behave lawlessly. You're, what you believe ends up working out in how you conduct your life. So if you believe that you are already saved, that you are a new person in Christ, if you believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, then you are given the task of daily mortifying your sinful flesh, what are you going to do? You're going to do that. If you don't, do you really believe it? You know, that, that, That's kind of the idea here. So what we believe always is going to be the thing that's going to inform how we act, right? Okay, all of that being said, there you go. Oscar, I hope that answered your question is that Oscar Watmore, by the way? Oscar, what, what's your last name? Is, if, if, uh, it is, if it is you, happy birthday. I saw your birthday uh, messages on Facebook. All right, coming back then, uh, Portillo, bummer, okay. Uh, well, Oscar Portillo, glad that you're here, and I'm sad that I, missed, I, I, I didn't get it right. <laughs> oh, well. All right, well, all right. So now we have more than one Oscar, okay. All right, Revelation 2.19. And uh, we talked about this last time, talking about uh, this idea regarding syncretism and strange people coming into the church who claim to have prophetic abilities and who end up leading people into uh, 
uh, into sexual immorality and other things. It's a strange, strange phenomenon, but one that we must be on guard against because it exists even to this day. You know, I think about the, uh, the, the sheer number of churches nowadays, and, and you ha- almost have to use the word church in a very loose sense. Um, the, in the, in what that teach that God blesses sexual immorality, what Scripture clearly defines as sexual immorality. Uh, you know, you, you think of like the ELCA and their, their charge to uh, ordain impenitent homosexuals and, uh, and their charge now to, um, to normalize polyamory and all kinds of just strange perversions that Scripture clearly says are contrary to the Word of God, all in the context of we are a church and we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And you sit there, how do you come to this conclusion? Well, no, n- nothing's changed. This is a problem that goes all the way back. So again, Revelation 2.19, Christ says to um, the, the church in Thyatira, the words of the Son who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze, I know your works, I know your love and faith and your service and your patient endurance. Again, this is like the major theme of the book of uh, Revelation, the idea of patient endurance. Your latter works, they exceed the first, so you're growing in good works. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. <laughs> uh-huh. So here we got a problem. So a prophetess woman has arisen, claims that she's a prophetess. I hear from the voice of God. And she is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality. Say what? Huh? Yeah, and to eat food that's sacrificed to idols. You can, again, think of syncretism here. I gave her time to repent. She refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Note the patience of Christ. First move when you got somebody, you know, engaging in false prophecy, teaching people to engage in sexual immorality, the first move of Christ is to be patient and give that person time to repent. But... They persist in that. So behold, I'm going to throw her under a sickbed. Those who commit adultery with her, I'll throw them into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. I will strike her children dead. Well, that seems brutal. Right. You'll note that there's a, a warning to how God um, punishes. And all the churches will know that I am he. And I want to see something in the Greek. Uh, yeah, that I am, ego e me. And this, this is another one of those points where I don't understand why the translators of the ESV chose this particular way of translating. Because, and that they will know that ego, hati ego e me, that I am. I, I really believe that as a reference to the divine name of God. They will know that I am, that I am God. And that he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Now in Scripture... Over and again, we hear these words. Christ is going to repay us according to our works. According to our works. Is this not a proof that we are saved by our works? No. No. Okay? I will show you a text that helps us along these lines. And if you pay attention to how this all works out, you'll recognize then that uh, it doesn't work out that way pun intended. In Matthew chapter 25, in a parable that doesn't read much like a parable, it's, it's, it's probably one of Jesus' most thinly veiled parables, it's the, the, the parable of the sheep and the goats on the day of judgment. And watch how this works. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne Before him will be gathered all the nations. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. In verse 33, the judgment has already taken place. You are judged first by what you are. Are you a sheep or are you a goat? So you'll know the separation has already occurred. Now it's just a matter of repayment. Being paid according to their works. The judgment's already taken place by what you are. 
You are either a sheep or you are a goat. Now, the Reformed take issue when I talk this way, and, uh, and I understand that because it's consistent with Calvinistic teaching, um, you know, because of their, of their understanding of the elect. But each and every one of us is born dead in trespasses and sins. We are born goats. And by the grace and mercy of God, working through the Word, we have been regenerated and we have been raised to life not as goats but as sheep. Now, the Reformed don't like that metaphor. They, they basically say you're born a sheep, you just don't know it. That's not quite how that works. So they take issue with the metaphor. Regardless, the judgment already takes place when Christ says, all right, sheep over here, goats over there. And you goats, you've been bad. That's what he says to them, by the way. That's in the Roseboro paraphrase. Tough crowd, tough crowd. <laughs> Those of you joining us digitally, I, you can't throw tomatoes at me. Okay. All right. Right? So you know, the judgments already take place. Then the king will say to those on the right. Now, the, those on the right, they are believers. And in our cross-reference here, I'm going to throw another cross-reference up. And I like coming back to this one because this is, just provides so much comfort. In the book of Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, we have these words in relation to the gospel. I'll start in verse 13. So this is po- partway through Paul's thought. You were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. God has made you alive together with Christ. That's the hymn there. Having forgiven us all our trespasses. So this is an important bit here because who's the one who made you alive together with Christ? God is the one, not you. Um, Dead people do not raise themselves from the dead. That's kind of the one thing we noticed about that. It, it, it's not like, you know, somebody is in an auto accident. They're taken to the hospital. While they're on their way to the hospital, they die. The, they, when they get to the hospital, you know, the, the team there, they, they get the electric paddles and they're shocking him and trying to get him to come back to life. And, but, of course, everything stays flat line. They don't sit there as a last resort and go, come on, you can do it. You just got to lean into life, man. Stop embracing death, dude. Okay, it it doesn't work like that, right? Okay, so when you're dead, 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 doobie doobie dead, not just mostly dead, okay? When you're dead, it takes an act of God to raise you to life. Joshua just threw tomatoes at me virtually. That's just terrible. Okay, okay. So you note the text says, God made you alive together with Christ. And then watch this, because this is the sentence goes on. Oftentimes, one of the, a good discipline is to learn to ignore the verse numbers and pay attention to the grammar and where the sentences end. Okay, so he made us alive together with Christ by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. So note, he has forgiven us our trespasses, and now we have a a picture then of what that means. God has canceled the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. So when you hear about on the last day, the books are open. Christ is going to repay you according to your works. He's going to judge you by your works. Do Christians have recorded anywhere in their book a single sin or a bad work? No. No. David. Bringing it back to modern day and what you've been in, brought to the forefront of me recently is within the past year or so, is that a lot of times I'm seeing these people in our news thinking that what is wrong is right. Yeah. And what is right what you and I think is right and common sense mm-hmm. is turning it upside down and telling us it is wrong. Yeah. Okay, and then me being a struggling uh, student of the word, somewhere in the Bible it says, it says, and I think it's in Revelation somewhere, 
they're repeating that. And, and, yeah. And, and I'm not a believer of, <coughs> of dwelling on the end times. Mm -hmm. But can you... Yeah. There is a text, and I don't know it off the top of my head, and I, and I failed to... I think that my search for it may be fruitless. But there is a text talking about how in sin, people believe that good is evil and evil is good. And, and that's, that's really the discombobulating nature of sin, is where you, for real, are so entrenched in a delusion caused by your rebellion against God that you think God is evil and that you're good. And that you think God is evil for saying that adultery is wrong, that thieving is wrong, that coveting is wrong, that lying is wrong. And you, 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 you get offended when somebody dares speaks the truth of Scripture and in so doing is saying you're a sinner. How dare you say that I'm a sinner? And so what they do is they believe that evil is good and good is evil. Yeah. Isaiah 5.20. All right, hang on a second. Let's take a look here. Isaiah 5, verse 20. Yeah, so, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. And that's really the issue, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Feel today on that on Jamal's question is sometimes you really don't know if you're right or wrong or upside down. Okay, but that's possible. Yeah, you, you should feel your faith. You should you should follow your faith and have faith in God that you are being led in the right direction. For the most part, that works. For me. Okay, so you, you went with feelings. Let me give you something a little bit stronger than feelings, something that our feelings can actually follow. Let, let, let me explain. So how do you know you're, you're on the right side of all of this? And so let, let, let me ask you a, an odd question, okay? And, of course, I can, I can tell that somebody who's going to be watching or listening on the Internet, they're going to groan because we're, we're going to go to Nazi Germany for a minute, okay? <laughs> yeah. As soon as you play the Hitler card, apparently you lose the argument or something. God but yeah. What? God yeah. So let me ask you this. Um, six million Jews exterminated by the Nazis. Was that evil? How do you know? It is evil. That is how God tells us. Because God tells us. What does God tell us? Thou shalt murder. So, so the idea here is this, is that we, in order to judge ourselves... And note, uh, we're going to start with, with me. You're going to start with you. In order to judge ourselves, we need an objective standard that we can look at. And then that also gives us the ability to make judgments out in the world. I know that Nazi, the Nazi Holocaust was pure evil because there were people who, contrary to God's command, you shall not murder, were murdered. And murdered in mass. Murdered in factory style. That, you know... It was like the industrial age version of murder. I mean, they got it down to an efficiency that is frightening. And that was really kind of the point. In the Nuremberg Trials, I believe that there was a movie made, I can't remember the name of it now, um, maybe Trial at Nuremberg or something like that. In the Nuremberg Trials, one of the Nazi war criminals tried the, uh, you, you know, you don't have any objective way of judging me. And he, in his defense, his defense was, the only reason why I'm on trial for war crimes is because the, the Allies won the war. If we had won the war, the, the things would have been flipped around. And it was an interesting argument, but the, the American prosecutor had to go with something objective. And he, he actually went objective and said, no, the reason why you're here is because objectively murder is evil. That's the reason why you're here objectively. And so he had to make an objective argument. So we, we have to understand this. How evil and good are defined is not based upon my feelings, nor is it based upon a vote. You know, if 51% of the population says this is good, that doesn't make a thing good. 
So in our, in our days now, you know, what have we seen happen you know, in, the, in the last decade? We've seen the, the United States government redefine marriage and take something that Scripture clearly says is sinful and make it so that that is considered good and it's right. And if you speak out against it, you are attacked and you are considered to be evil. Yeah. Everybody else is doing it. So, and I hear my mom saying, and if all your friends told you to jump off a cliff, would you jump off a cliff too? Yeah. Everybody else is doing it. <laughs> Funny that you would say that, though, by the way. <laughs> Dave. Yeah, uh, my apologies, my snark went on. Um, but <laughs> in Romans 1, talking about humanity's really slide into into sin. Uh, you know, consider what Romans 1 says in this regard, though. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And here's the problem. Who by their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. That's what we do. We all do that. Okay? And any of you out there denying that you do that, just give me four minutes with your spouse and I'll debunk it. Okay? Because when your spouse tells you you did something wrong, your immediate response is, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. And, and you know, either he or she has to, to you know, wrestle you to the ground before, and get you to say, uncle. Okay? My wife has to do that to me. And I, I have to do that with her. And y'all are married to sinners, every one of you, anyway, that are married. It's how this works, right? So they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. What can be known about God, by the way, is plain to them because God's shown it to them. God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that men are without excuse. So note this then. When it comes to the existence of God, Scripture is clear. There is no such thing as an atheist. God does not believe in atheists. So when you run across some Yahoo saying, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God, and I'll prove to you God doesn't exist. This, this, is, this is a person who knows that God exists, and they are just obsessed with trying to find some way to get God out of their mind, all right, and to suppress that truth. Although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God. They didn't give thanks to him. No. They became futile in their thinking. And so you'll note that with, with the suppression of the truth, your thinking gets futile. It gets delusional. All right, let me continue reading. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gives them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. And then it gets worse. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. Men likewise gave up natural relations with women. They're consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameful acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. So you go from futile to debased to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips. Yeah, by the way, gossips in this list are worse than homosexuals. Just want to make that clear. Slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, and disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. This is, this is what I see on the news every night. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but here's the last part. They give approval to those who practice them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So why is the 49% of the people here in the United States doing that? Why? Yeah. I mean, they know better. Okay. All right. So the question is, well, why, why, why? They know, they know better and they're, 
And why are they doing that? I'm going to answer the question in just a minute, but I want to come back to our book, our text in Revelation. So, look, I'm, going to... I don't, I'm not going political on this. Right. No, no. Oh, I get it. I get it. I, we'll talk about this in a second. But Josh, you wanted to make a point real quick? Yeah, one, of the, um, one of the things that people will say is one of the lines of the rhetoric that you hear from people who are doing, calling good, evil, evil good, is, and this makes me laugh, I'm on the right side of history. That's, that's what their, uh, their argument is, is that I'm on the right side of history. Is it history itself is some sort of metric that we should be measured by? Well, funny enough, um, since we know how the end of history is going to go down. They're not on the right side of they're, eternity. They're not on the right side of, not, not only are they not on the right side of history, they're not on the right side of eternity, as you pointed out. So the idea here is, how does human history end? Human history ends with Christ separating the sheep from the goats. All right. So anybody who claims that they're on the right side of history, um, I would argue the Nazis made that claim pretty early on because Hitler's rhetoric was that he was creating a millennial Reich, you know, the thousand-year glorious reign of the Aryans. You know, that didn't last very long, by the way. And uh, he, even though he thought he was on the right side of history, he proved to be on the wrong side because he didn't factor in the wrath of God against his, uh, his sin. So... All of that being said, let's come back to this text and then we'll go into Revelation and then I'll answer your question along the way, Dave. Is that uh, so he places on his right the the sheep and the the goats on his left. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So you'll note when it comes to Christ then repaying their works, there are no sins recorded in their book that his eyes are going to look at. Because the whole record of debt has been canceled and nailed to the cross. If you are a sheep, the only thing recorded are your good works. And note this. Hebrews says without faith it's impossible to please God. Without faith it's impossible. So watch what he says. I was hungry, you gave me food. Why would a sheep give Christ food if Christ was hungry? Because that's what sheep do. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. Why would sheep give a drink to Jesus? Because that's what sheep do. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him. Notice it doesn't say the sheep. The righteous. These are those who are clothed in the righteousness of Christ by grace through faith. They are righteous. They will answer the Lord. And they're going to scratch their heads and go, huh? Huh? So, Dave, one thing I know about you, um, you haven't had coffee with Jesus yet, have you? (laughs) Yeah, neither have I. Okay. So, I mean, have you clothed Jesus? Have you fed him? No. But the one thing I know about you is that you have taken care of of your brothers and sisters in Christ in need. I know that for a fact. right? And so you'll note that even the least good work that you do for a Christian brother because they are a Christian brother in meeting their needs, that Christ repays you as if you had done that for Him personally. Now all of a sudden you realize, wow, those good works that we are created in Christ Jesus to do They're huge. They're not minor things. To stay-at-home moms, Christ would say, I wet my diapers and you change them. Yeah. I was struggling with my algebra and you helped me. I couldn't figure out how poetry works and you tried to explain it to me and I still didn't get it. But that, that's, a, that's, right, that's, a, that's a different text. <laughs> yeah, I have some poetic problems. So. But why aren't the, the masses on the other side of that curtain getting it? Well, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll get this. We'll get there. Okay? So I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Righteous will say, Lord, when do we see you hungry? Feed you, thirsty, give you a drink. And when do we see you a stranger, welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? 
When do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, my brothers. And according to the Gospel of Matthew, who are the brothers of Christ? Those who believe in him. Right? If you did it to them, you did it to me. Now here come the goats. Remember Hebrews 11 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. It's impossible. It's not difficult. It's impossible. It can't be done. You might as well try to swim to the top of Mount Everest. It can't be done. Okay? It's impossible. So to say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry and you gave me no food. Now we know from what Christ says to the sheep, what's the, the operative thing here? How believers treat each other, and that's all because of Christ. So when somebody comes to you and preaches the gospel to you and says, you're a sinner, You earned the wrath of God by your wickedness. You have woefully fallen short. But God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son that if you believe in him, you will not perish. But he will give you eternal life as a gift. So repent and believe this good news. And they sit there and go, you are such an idiot. Oh, my word. Bless your heart. (laughs) Right? Believe me, I I have family from Memphis and from Atlanta. And when they say, bless your heart, that means you're stupid. Okay? And then they'd offer you sweet tea afterwards. Okay? That's how that goes. Right? They're rejecting Christ. And then they're going to turn around and they're going to mistreat you. Because nobody is neutral when it comes to Jesus. Nobody. Nobody. You are either at war and hostile towards God or you are at peace with God because of Christ. And then that peace that we have with God, then we have with each other. We look out for each other. If one of us gets arrested and thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, we're there visiting them in prison. When one of us loses a job, we are there opening up our checkbooks, giving them our money so that they can pay their rent because that's what we do for the sake of Christ. But the unbelievers, they reject Jesus altogether. So when his saints and the preachers of the gospel come, they have nothing to do with them. And he says, I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. Then they will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty Stranger, naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you. He'll answer them, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to the least of these. And who's he pointing to? The righteous, the least of these. You did not do it to me. So nothing they did counts. Nothing. Any good, well, well, Jesus, I, 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 I was the vice president of the Rotary Club. In Grand Forks. But, 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 but Jesus, G- G- Jesus, I, uh, I, I gave to the poor. I, I worked to stop systemic racism in the United States. You see? And they, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So when you hear a text where you hear from Jesus' own mouth that he is going to Give to each according to their works. Please note, that is absolutely true. But the important thing is faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And by faith, we have been given the righteousness of God. We have been declared righteous. Our sins have been forgiven. The whole record of debt that stood against us has been canceled. So on the day of judgment, Christians, you got much to look forward to. That is going to be an amazing day. And I think our jaws are going to be on the floor when we consider 
the generosity of Christ as he repays each and every one of us for works that we considered to be lowly and despised. So James, every time you take out the trash, Christ is keeping track of that. Right? Every time. And when you clean up your room, and you put all those Legos where they belong, that's a good work. Christ is taking, you know, taking note of that as well. Okay? So you, you, you get the idea here. Okay? So Christ says, I will give to each one of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. Fascinating in that congregation. They were, there were people who were aware of this Jezebel, false prophetess woman, and what they were doing. And the murmurs had gotten back to them, and they called it the deep things of Satan. Whatever that doctrine is, we don't even want to know. right? To you, I, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. To the one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Now notice here, who keeps my works. That's another way of talking about faith. How can you keep the works of Jesus? By believing them, what he did for you. So we again, we always conquer by faith. To him I will give authority over the nations. And here's the weird thing. We, we get, you're starting to get a picture here of something about the new earth. A good way to talk about the new earth is as the kingdom of Christ. Because Christ will sit on the throne of David forever. But it's a kingdom of kings. Isn't that weird? And, and so you'll note here that there is a promise for Christians in this lifetime that, th- that they will have authority over nations, that they will be given authority. So this is a kingdom of kings under King Jesus. You'll note that Christ then shares his authority and he rules and reigns through us. Now, let me ask you this, okay? I, I hate the idea of being a politician. At one point, I actually wanted to go into politics. Yeah. And, uh, and then I realized that what uh, Mark Twain said was right. Poly, politics is, comes from two words, uh, word poly meaning many and ticks meaning bloodsuckers. So, you know, <laughs> but uh, the, the problem is, is that polit- politicians in this life, what a mess. Your job, for the most part, is to just basically keep evil at bay. That's really the job of a politician, to enact policies to punish evildoers so that good things can happen for law-abiding citizens. But the good things that happen, the law-abiding citizens always do good under the threat of punishment by the government. Believe me, if, you know, how many of you this year, when you heard they were not going to require you to pay your taxes or to file your taxes until July, filed them in January or March? I waited until the, the last day, okay? So, to, okay, that's like, if I don't have to pay it, you're not going to punish me, I'm not going to give you my money a minute sooner than I have to, okay? But I know I have to, because <laughs> if I don't, eh, there's bad consequences, right? David. Well, what we always thought there was going to be punishments for got turned upside down on their heads yeah. after these rioting when they're going to... I don't understand... If, if you're going to hold somebody accountable, and isn't it the government at that point in time to do so? Why yeah. Why aren't they doing it? And then why are so many people on the side of defunding the police? Why are so many people on the side of letting these people have a have their uh, will in, in, in these other states? That okay, so let's, let's talk about that real quick. Okay, so the question on the table is why, why are so many people doing evil and thinking they're doing good? I, if I could rephrase the question. Because here, here's what's going on. And it, people have bought in to a false narrative. And let me explain that, that narratives have power to control our actions. So here's the thing. All the people who are burning down Kenosha and, burning, and rioted and burned down other business and stuff like that, do they believe they are doing evil or do they believe they are doing good? They believe they're doing good. They believe that what they're doing is virtuous. 
And not on top of that, the narrative is because you are silent as you white man, you are complicit in the violence that they claim is taking place in the United States. So what's the narrative? What's the narrative that's informing them? Their narrative is that racism has never been solved in the United States. This is their, their, their narrative. So you have the United States founded during a time when slavery was uh, not only legal, was uh, quite the industry, especially in agricultural parts of the United States in the South. And so it was based upon racism. This is how the claim goes. So what happened? We fought a civil war. Civil war, what, we get the 13th Amendment in the Civil War, which puts an end to slavery. Ah, but the narrative points something out. There's a loophole in the 13th Amendment. The loophole in the 13th Amendment is, is that slavery is outlawed unless somebody has committed a felony. And so as the narrative goes, once the Civil War ended and the slaves were freed, the South systemically went about criminalizing or you know, basically coming up with felony criminal charges that every black person then was effectively re-enslaved and became prisoners. And so the method by which the United States keeps slavery going on to this day is through the criminal justice system. And their claim is, is that what is happening in the United States, the police and the criminal justice system and the prison industry have all conspired to re-enslave black people or keep them enslaved and that they are not really engaged in real criminal justice, and that the vast majority of people who are African Americans who are in prison, the reason they're in prison is because these racist pol police forces you know, basically charge them with felonies, felonies to the effect of they're guilty of being black. That? That's their narrative. Well, that's their narrative. Yeah. So what they're fighting is the perception or the belief that the United States is still a nation of slaveholders. Rather than them being on the plantation, the slaves are in the prisons. And who are they working for? The slaves are working for Fortune 500 companies who hire prisoners to do work at two, three, four, five dollars an hour. That's the claim. So when you hear talk about systemic racism, why are they defunding the police? The reason they're defunding the police is because the police are the, is the mechanism for enslaving people. That's their claim. Well, I need to be educated otherwise. Yeah. And that's the thing. So in their claim then, capitalism is the driving force behind all of this. Why do they need to be enslaved? Well, because capitalism. So the way you get rid of slavery in their Marxist narrative is you in basically turn the United States into a communist nation and there'll be no need for enslaving people because the corporations will be gone. Private property will be dissolved. In their view, everybody, the United States will become a utopia. Yeah. Well, they, I don't know why I watch. <laughs> one of the prevailing narratives now is that there is um, literature that's being written and published that basically is coming to the conclusion that the only answer to racism is more racism in the sense that yeah. we need to balance the scales. Yeah. We need to, like, like, the only response to prejudice and whatever is to basically prejudice against those who they believe to be the ones in power. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. right, yeah. but Yeah. So, so that's the narrative. So you understand, they think they're doing good and that their actions are virtuous because they have incited an open rebellion against an oppressive racist system that is still enslaving African Americans. They believe the narrative, 
and they believe that their actions are not only justified, but required. The goal is the overthrow of the United States Constitution and the present republic, and the disbanding of capitalism and the enforcing, basically turning the United States into the, the 21st century version of the Soviet Union. That's the goal. Hmm? Did people even realize that the Soviet Union failed? Oh, but that wasn't real communism. Yeah, that's what they always say. You always point them out. Yes. Everywhere this has been tried, it has failed miserably, and people have tried to flee from their lives from this stuff. It takes stuff. three or four generations for them to realize that, and the people who were against it before yeah. are dead now, so they're not there to teach that stuff. Right. Yeah. Because the, our parents, my parents, put the fear in me of what communism could be. Yeah. It's all playing. Yeah. Yeah. My best friend. People are not listening to us out there. Yep. The school systems, like Josh said, aren't helping us any. Mm-hmm. The, the teachers, God bless all the teachers out there that are trying to do their work in educating our kids, are getting fed a curriculum that is based on the the the, the evil that these people, union leaders, are instilling into the writers of this curriculum for all these unknowingly teachers that have been indoctrinated mm-hmm. in liberal colleges along the way, and I'm not going political here, but it's, it's the truth. Uh, so then they go in and they teach the kids what you just said, mm-hmm. what the narrative is, mm-hmm. and everything is good, and they're going along with it. And I do believe there, is more, there are more white kids out there, people, on this bandwagon, and there are blacks, and I think that discredits them too. So we know it's the school systems that are doing this. Yeah, yeah, and but uh, that's not the point of our Bible study. But your points are well noted. I don't. Yeah, dis- it is, though. I yeah. Asked Paul, yeah. Well, you asked I, why. I said why. Yeah. Is, are they saying what right? Yeah. Now, so you're going to note then. Right is wrong. You gave me the the, the, the biblical part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you're going to note then, you're going to note then, they believe that they are acting virtuously. That's the weird thing. You can get so turned around that you can justify evil in the context of a narrative. Okay, so what's been taking place? Destruction of property, the murder of innocent human beings. This has been taking place in our streets in the last few months. Not, not one or two incidents. We're talking about... I've lost track of how many different protests there are. How many, okay. Right. So all of this going on, the people who are instigating this, they believe that they are acting virtuously. They are calling evil good. That's how, and, and the narrative is what's driving. They know not what they do. Uh, indeed. Indeed. So, I can, I can, okay, what do we do to fight against it? Great question. All right, so let me, let me go on a tiny excursus and then we've got to wrap up. Okay, and this will be our last thought of the day for now because I, I have to wrap up and head off to serve another uh, congregation. What do we do? The reason why this is happening is because 150 years ago, a little more than that actually now, a book was written by a fellow by the name of Charles Darwin called The Origin of the Species. And the church lost its nerve and abandoned its belief that the Bible is the Word of God. And so what has happened and what has gone on unchecked in the Christian church is rank unbelief masquerading as Christian piety. People running around the church saying, you can't trust the Bible. And rather than preach repentance and the forgiveness of sins, because here's the thing. You know why sinners sin? Because they're sinners. Right. And so the, the church long ago stopped believing that the Bible is the Word of God. 
And you have entire congregations that are set up now. In fact, you have these abandoned urban cathedrals that are like artifacts of a day long gone by. A a, a cathedral in a city like Chicago that can seat a thousand and at one point did. And you got 30 gray-haired old ladies and a cat who show up with their liberal pastor there. And they are taught the Bible isn't true. Sin isn't sin. Just do good things and make a difference in the world. That's all that you can do. And they go, yes, that's right. But the reason why there's nobody in that congregation is because only the Word of God can raise somebody from the dead. The church has been given the task of proclaiming repentance and the forgiveness of sins. And if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, you ain't going to preach that. So what happened is, is that when a whole group, I mean a large mass of seminary students, were taught this nonsense that the Bible can't be trusted, and they get into the pulpit, and they start telling everybody, oh, the resurrection of Jesus is just a metaphor for spring. And it reminds us of when our tulips come back after a hard winter. Rather than preaching that Christ rose bodily from the dead, nobody is believing the truth anymore And the church is not evangelizing. Christians aren't being made. And as a result of it, we're watching in our lifetime the sheer number of Christians as a percentage of our population dwindling and dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. And the people who remain, they're listening to like nonsensical yahoos like Bill Johnson of Bethel or Cat Kerr or some weird freaks out there, you know, claiming to hear the voice of God and they're not being taught the word of God at all. You want to turn this around? Get the heretics out of the church and start telling the world they're a bunch of sinners and Christ died for their sins and they need to repent and believe the gospel. That's the only hope. People don't want to do that. Of course they don't. Of course they don't. So the the only hope to turn this around is the gospel. Period. Well, yeah, I don't want to do that every morning. Yep, yep. Okay. All right, real quick here. Uh, Carlos says, how would double predestination fit in here if God is giving a chance for repentance? Um, you're going to note, Carlos, in this particular case, technically we're supposed to be, uh, he's writing to a church, so you're supposed to be talking to somebody who, Christ is supposed to be talking to somebody who is a, a believer who's supposed to be repenting. So if they were chosen not to be elected, why bother offering repentance? I, your, your point is well taken, by the way. This verse negates double predestination, limited atonement. In one sense, it does. I agree. Oscar Portillo says, uh, the text in Revelation says, be hot or cold, but not lukewarm. You're getting ahead of me, Oscar. You're getting ahead. Uh, that's for the church of Laodicea. We'll get to that maybe next week or the week after, because he'll spit you out of his mouth. What does that mean exactly? Does it mean you can lose your salvation? Like I said, we will talk about that when we get to the letter to the church of Laodicea to see us, so I would say stay tuned. Bless your heart. It's all about context, 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 indeed. How should we interpret crowns of rewards in relation to works of righteousness? I think, Carlos, you answered your own question when you recognized that we throw our crowns before Christ. <laughs> it's like, we're not worthy of them anyway. I, I look terrible in a tiara, so, uh, you know, I, I have no problem giving it back to Christ. All right, so you get the idea. All right, peace to you, brothers and sisters. I've got to go because I have another congregation to serve. We'll see you guys, Lord willing, next time.